the UKW. And uh, he's going to talk about the Nano VNA, which is an incredibly powerful gadget that a lot of people are really getting a lot out of. And uh, a lot of other people are going, well, what the heck can I do with this thing? So uh, let's turn it over to Warren and find out. Thank you, Andy. And uh, you really, you, you summed it all up. That, that's my presentation. It's an incredibly powerful gadget. And uh, what can you do with it? So that's uh, right up the screen. Um, Andy, do I have, is the audio okay? Okay, I saw a nod of the head. I'm sorry, I muted myself to, yes, you, you sound great. Yeah, the head nod was enough. Just wanted to make sure. So, I mean, it'd be better if you couldn't hear me, but that's okay. We're, we'll go this way for the moment. And I just have to find the correct thing to click on here. We'll do that and we'll go from the beginning. All right, hopefully everybody can see a nano VNA box. Does that look right? Okay, Andy says yes. And by the way, Norm and, and Andy, if you notice that a lot of people have just uh, shut off and you want me to shut up, then, uh, then go ahead and let me know. But otherwise, because um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be watching the presentation like the rest of you. So anyway, th I wanted to uh, try to figure out how to present the nano VNA. And I decided I'd do it really as an introduction and just share some ideas and some practical things. Uh, as Andy said, it's, it's a very powerful device. And we have a number of people in the club that have them. And so they may know as much or more than I do. But uh, hopefully this will fill you in if you're thinking of getting one or if you have one. I know a couple people who said they bought one. I haven't figured out how to use it yet. So this should be helpful. At least that's my hope. So when you buy it, that's the nice box you get. And inside, it's got a little plastic filler, and you, you get all these little parts in there. And the pen will give you an idea of its size. It's not, not real big, and it's not heavy. And you pull this stuff out, you get this uh, a cord that's a USB-A to USB-C, a double USB-C, a couple little jumpers, those three little fittings, and a double female. Not a whole lot of stuff. But what is this thing? Well, on the right, you can see there's a little, it's basically a rocker switch. It'll go left, it'll go right. You can uh, change values. You can move uh, things on the screen. Um, you can also work through the menus with it. If you press it, it works, much, well, it's much like the center button on a mouse, where if you, you can press it, you can roll it. It just doesn't roll all the way around like a mouse button. Power switch is self-explanatory. And then there are the two test ports on the left side. And that's the, the main external features of it. It does have a charging port on the bottom and a tiny little hole that will glow red, as I recall, when you're charging it. These things are important. These are calibration terminations. This is seeing kind of into them. The one on the left is a short. The next middle one is open and the right hand one is a 50 ohm load. And that's important to, to calibrate the instrument, which we will talk about quite a bit. And you can keep it straight because the 50 ohm one has a silver color to it. And that's convenient, otherwise I'd get really confused. So that's it, that's what you see. That's what you get in the box, basically. You do get this menu structure map, but it does not come with any instructions. You can go out to the web, you can find a lot of stuff, uh, someone I was talking to today said, you find a lot of things on YouTube. A lot of it is wrong. <laughs> so you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt, but there are a lot of uh, uh, tutorials. And if you want to learn about VNAs, vector network analyzers, there's a huge amount of information out there. So, but this is it. If you were to use this menu structure map and try to teach yourself how to use this, I think you'd give up right away. I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how to do it from this. And I decided, no, nope, I won't do that. It didn't work. And I had to resort to reading things on the web. Well, Norm, I saw you put your glasses on and, and lean forward. Are you able to see the screen okay? 
you're muted, but I saw a thumbs up. Okay, just, just letting you know. Don't try to memorize this. I'm going to come back to this a couple times as we go through this, give you an idea how different parts of this are used. So this is something I borrowed from uh, another presentation. Uh, what can it do? Okay, well, forget the S11 and the S21 for a moment. I'm going to come back to those later. The main thing that you're going to want to focus on, it can do antenna measurements. VSWR is something that we really all need to know about. And this is easy to use as an antenna analyzer. But if you've got various loads, you can find out what kind of impedance they have. You can test power splitters, diplexers. I have an example of, of some testing with a diplexer in here. Return loss, cable impedance. Um, if you've got an attenuator, what if you have a TVI filter? Does it work? Where does it cut off? Okay, well, you could test something like that. Thing I never thought about before was crystals or resonant uh, circuits that you might stick into your radio. Hey, you can stick these into your VNA circuit and you can test them. Are they working? Are they right? The uh, cable electrical length, velocity factor, that's a cool thing. And this list doesn't have it, but um, the, um, uh, the TDMA time domain reflectometer, okay? A time domain reflectometer, best way to think about that is, think about radar. Radar puts out a pulse of energy. It goes out a distance, it hits an airplane, some of it comes back, but it continues out further, it hits another airplane, and a signal comes back from that. The system then interprets that, the time delay, as distance and, and gives you a presentation. Well, a time domain reflectometer can do the same sort of thing. You can hook up your coax and see, hey, I think this thing got kinked at one point. I've straightened it out. Is it good or is it bad? If it's got a bad kink, the energy will go down the coax. It'll hit that bad spot. Some of it will reflect back, just like off of an airplane, and it'll go out to the other end. So if you wanted to, you can set it up that way. I haven't set it up as a, a time domain reflectometer yet but it is doable. There's instructions. So lots of things you can do with this tool. Now, we need to know how to do SWR. Okay, that's, that's the main thing that we do as hams. These are a couple of old SWR uh, meters. What did we do? We went to a band, we'd select a frequency, we'd key down, we'd set the meter to forward, we'd turn a knob till it was at full scale, We'd flip the, the switch to reflected. We'd read the SWR. We'd write it down. We'd go to another frequency, repeat that whole process. We'd do a number of points across the band, and we'd find out, oh, antenna is resonant somewhere around here. It's low. It's high. Or, God, it didn't even resonate on, in the band. It's, it's terrible at the high end. It's bad at the bottom end, but it's getting better. So it's resonant somewhere down below. So my 20-meter antenna, it might be resonant at 12 meg. Okay. Whoops. I need to do some tuning. So this is how we used to do it. And God knows we did it. Now, yeah, it would be good to turn your transmitter down to 10 watts. I'm not sure how many people did. And, of course, anytime you go to new frequency, we know we're supposed to say, is the frequency in use? Well, if you're going to take seven or eight measurements across the band, you probably didn't do that. It was, it was kind of rude. There were carriers every now and then. So we had to do something, though, to measure our stuff. Well, technology moved on. Uh, there's like the MFJ 257 and two, or 267 or 69, something like that. But this was a little bit newer. This is the MFJ 226. It's a graphical impedance analyzer. Now, these tools are really wonderful because they work on low power, okay? You're not going to disturb the band. Furthermore, because it's such low power, you can go outside the band. So you can see what's happening to your antenna outside the band. If it's resonant outside the band, you can find out how far. You're not transmitting where you're causing a problem. Self-calibrating, they use a sweep frequency. So you don't have to turn a VFO and select this or that. You can set start here and there. It sweeps. It's going to measure impedance, resistance, reactance, and things like return loss, VSWR, those S11 things. And like I said, I'll get to the S, S rating, the S notation soon. It computes the results and gives you graphical display. Usually you'll have some sort of a, an SWR curve. 
But the Smith chart is a wonderful additional tool. There's some learning to do to, to use those. But here's an example. It's showing a Smith chart out there. And it's giving us some, some information. The S11 reading has a, a magnitude and the phase. So let's think about the nano VNA versus the uh, MFJ226. Well, the nano has a lot bigger frequency range. It's got a rechargeable battery, at least the one that I bought had a rechargeable battery in it. And let me tell you, the 226 sucks up those AA batteries. <laughs> I think you can get two or three hours total use out of it. I think it even sucks them dry when you, you're not using it. The Nano has a color display and with multiple colors, and the MFJ is just monocolor. You can, you can have several things happening on the Nano at one time. You can get different graphs up simultaneously, get more information. The M MFJ, just one thing. Frequency markers, I'm going to go into a little bit later, but they give you a reference. You see, you can set the top and bottom of a band or the middle of the band or something like that. You can't do that with the 226. And look at the price. I mean, this is the thing that's going to, going to just kill you. 300 bucks in 2017 for the MFJ. The Nano VNA does it all, does more, does better in almost every way. And I paid 65 65 I like it. I think it is a credible machine. Now, my world doesn't usually work with SMA connectors. That's the little tiny connectors. So you probably have to spend a few more bucks. This is, <laughs> this is some of the extra plumbing that I have. But most of us are going to use N connectors or UHF connectors, the PL259, SO239 type things. Um, also, be aware that SMA connectors are not considered high durability. I have read that they may have a 400 cycle use. So by the time you've connected and disconnected 400 times, your SMA connector may be going bad. So a good thing to consider is to get a little male female fitting. Uh, I think I just bought some on Amazon for less than $7, bought a pair. So if you do that, you hook one of those up and you just leave it on. By the time it's worn out with 400 connections, you buy another one. So if you got to replace that 400 times and 400 times each, uh, each one beyond that, that's, my God, was that 160,000 tests, something like that. So that's great. The disadvantage to having those little extenders is it won't fit back in the box unless you modify the box. But not, not a big problem. Not a big problem. Blah. So how does it work? Well, I already mentioned it has a swept frequency oscillator, and that's represented as the blue dot upper left. That source signal is measured. It's, it's taken off and it's measured. And, oh, I should mention the green thing kind of in the center top, the DUT, that stands for device under test. So that's the thing you want to measure. Now that could be an antenna could be a TVI filter, it could be a crystal, it could be anything, it could be a piece of coax. But anything you're testing is the DUT. But this is going to generate a source signal, measure its uh, strength, it's going to get some reflection. Whenever you hook up anything up, you get a little bit of reflection, it's going to measure that, it's going to check the phase angle, I'm going to talk about phase in a minute, but the phase angle between the incident and reflected waves. It also, then, if something goes through, it has that second port. It measures the transmitted. The, the, that's not as in our radio transmission. It's the signal that got through the network you're testing. That's the transmitted signal as, as you're using it here. And it measures that and the phase angle of that compared to the source. Then it puts it through the detector and processes it so that you can see it and make sense out of it. That's your basic. You'll see this chart again. I mentioned the word phase. I believe that some of our members are technician class licensees. And I, it's my understanding that you don't get into AC things until you do the general class. So I just want to spend a, a quick minute talking about phase and sine waves. So here we see a circle and we see some numbers around it. One, two, three, four, five. So if you think of that as uh, something with an arm that sticks out from the center and goes counterclockwise, and we're measuring the height above and below the horizontal axis. So at time one, on the right signal, we see 
it's at zero. By the time you get up to two, you can see that the two in the circle and on the sine wave are at the same place. At three, it's at the top, highest point. Then it circles around to four and five. And all those traces, if you, if you turned it a little tiny bit on the circle and you measured the height above the axis, which is related to the sine, trigonometric sine, then what you'd get are all those points that are in the right trace. That's how a sine wave comes about. That's a clean thing. If this is an audio frequency, you hear a nice clean tone. If it's an RF transmission, that's our carrier, you want a nice clean tone. You want that nice clean shape. So that's the, the origin of the concept of the sine wave. So now that I said I'm gonna talk about phase. So if you have two different waves, they can be different heights, that's it's not a problem. But if they don't start at the same time, one starts later or earlier than the other. It doesn't matter which one you're using. One of them is your reference and the other one is what you're comparing with. So this picture says it's a 45 degree separation. Okay, so from the solid line, line A, that's our reference. It starts at some time. The dashed line starts later and they don't get to the peak at the same time anywhere along there. They're the same frequency, so this relationship will last forever. So now I'm gonna back up just one quick slide. If I can make my mouse work, do I want? So there's 45 degrees from the one to the two. That's 45 degrees of a circle's revolution. That's how this phase difference is to be remembered. The circle is the basis. If you get into advanced SDR uh, mathematics, which I attempted to at one time, you'll see the, uh, the trigonometric relationships for sine waves in there. Omega T it happens a lot. So, but 45 degrees, you can see from the horizontal to 45 degrees up, that's one eighth of a circle. This is what it looks like when it's phased one eighth of a circle apart. So that's the idea of phase, okay? Um, let's see, reflecting transmitted. So with our source signal, we have the reflected and the transmitted, they can be at different phases, okay? So this device is going to be checking all of that out. Now, we can compare two voltages. We could compare two currents. We can compare a voltage to a current phase is still the same concept. When does it peak? When does it start? That's how you want to think about it. Now, if they're not at the same frequency, then you'd have a constantly changing phase because one would be moving faster so that they'd be in phase, they'd be out of phase, they'd be back in phase. Now, we don't really need to worry about that here, but if you are thinking about it, you'd say, well, wait a minute, you told me this thing sweeps the frequencies. So it's changing frequency all the time. So don't I have that problem with it being in phase and out of phase and changing? The answer is no, we don't have that problem because it's sampling. So it does a real quick sample. It's at some frequency. It's gonna sample the source reflected and transmitted. Then it goes to a different frequency and real quick, it does the samples again. Now it can't do it instantaneously. Nothing is instantaneous, but it does it fast enough that it's functionally as though it was sampling at a single frequency. So these other two words is vector versus scalar. And these words come out of mathematics and physics. So, oh God, this is really scary stuff. Not really. Scalars have magnitude only. I have five pi's. Okay, that's if, you, if your mathematics that you had in school had a number line, okay, that's a scalar. It's just a number. So if I say the ISS is orbiting 100 miles from the Earth's surface, all I told you is how much. But vectors have magnitude and direction. So with the same idea, the ISS is actually 30 degrees to the right of true north, up 45 degrees from the horizontal plane, and 144 miles away. Now you've got a direction and the magnitude. That's the idea behind a vector, okay? So in electronics, magnitude is like your voltage or your current. 
That's the number. And the direction part of it is the phase. That's why I'm bringing up phase so much because this becomes important in AC circuits. So in the VNA, of course, like I said, the reference oscillator is the source oscillator. And this is why it's called a vector network analyzer. It's not just a network analyzer, it's a vector network analyzer. This is what it's doing inside. So now you got a little better appreciation for not only all this jibber jabber on the screen, but what it has to do. Because it wants to know how the device under test changed the circuit, changed the waves that went either through it or went to it and came back. Your antenna, for example, if your antenna is not perfectly resonant, and by the way, they never are, they will exhibit either inductive or capacitive results. And that will show up in that reflected wave. This is useful information if you're trying to get the antenna to work correctly. So now down here, I've got the red line and it points over and you see that it's got channel zero and channel one. Okay, so I, you saw the ports, but now you're seeing, oh, they're labeled. Now, they've also got these things on there that say S11 and S21. I promised I'd come back to that. S11 is the signal received at port number one that originated from port number one. So the first number is where it's received. So S21 is what's received at port number two that was originated at port number one. So if I'm measuring SWR, I'm going to use an S11. And if I'm measuring through something like uh, through coax, through a, a TVI filter, it's S21. Okay. So I really wish they had called these channel one and channel two because the, the, port concept goes with all vector network analyzers. The channel thing is seems to be just sort of the nano VNA. If they called it channel one and channel two, it'd be real easy because S11 would be channel one at channel one. But this was, threw me off for a short time initially. But these S parameters are important. Okay, so this actually started, S parameters stands for scattering. It came from apparently back in 1965. I tried doing some reading about it. I decided you don't want to know a lot about that. <laughs> but this is a good thing. A light an analogy, okay? Now, in the middle is maybe a lens. It could be a piece of glass. We all know if we look at a piece of glass at, at a window that we can see some reflected light. We might be able to see ourselves with a, a percentage. Something like 5% of the light will be reflected back from a window. So. Think about it as light from inside the room goes to the window. Some of it is reflected. Some of it is transmitted. Okay. If it's a lens, we know that the light is bent. So the same analogy comes into our electronic circuits when we're using the VNA. And so here, again, a bunch of things that can be done with it, gain and loss. VSWR, that's what we're going to focus on here. But another way of looking at it is... If I'm sending energy to my antenna, what's my return loss? Because it's related. If I have a great VSWR, almost all my energy goes into the antenna. I get very little reflected. But if I have a bad match, I get a lot reflected. So return loss and VSWR are actually related. Different picture, but this is, again, that terminology that VNAs use. S11, S21. So S22, that means the signal received at port number two that originated at port number two. The nano VNA doesn't originate any signals at, at its channel one, which is port number two. It only originates signal from the one port, from channel zero. So it's simpler. But VNAs, you could get a, if you want to spend enough money, you can get a VNA that might have eight channels and be able to originate signals at all of the eight channels and sort it all out and tell you the signal at all the other ports from each port that it was hooked up to. So you might be able to hook up this big octopus to something, I don't know what it would be, but you could hook up the octopus and it would do all the measurements for you and give you all the data. 
this is not that elaborate, not that expensive. So we're just going to worry about S11 and S21 measurements. It can get deep fast, and it did. This diagram that I'm showing on the left, notice it says introduction to VNA basics. This is a primer. This is just to get you started. <laughs> and by the way, this is on page two. So it's, it's talking about different things. You can really get into it. It's very interesting. It's useful. But you're going to want to make it simple. And I don't blame you. I want to make it simple too. So, and K-I-S-S. -S. Does everybody know that? Keep it simple. I won't tell you what the last S is. But anyway, so if you get one of these and you want to set it up, you've got these basic steps, basic ideas you want to do. First thing you're going to do is you're going to tell it, what frequency range do I want to work at? Now, you can do it with a single frequency. If you want to simulate a CW wave at a single frequency, hey, maybe you're working on a repeater cavity or something. You don't necessarily have to sweep. You might want to have it at a single frequency. It'll do that for you. But you, dis you establish the frequency or frequency range that you want to do. Then you perform a calibration. That's why you've got those three little things, the short, the open, and the 50 ohm load. It's important you do the calibration. Your wires that are hooked up to it become part of the circuit. If you calibrate using those wires, this thing will compensate for the wires, so you'll only test your device. But if you, cal if you just calibrate it blind and then you hook up the, uh, a wire to it, a cable, then that becomes part of your device under test. And I'll come back to that again, but it's an important thing to realize. If you're testing your antenna and you're testing it from inside your shack, you got coax. That's part of your circuit. If you really want to test the antenna, you either test the antenna at the antenna or you do the calibration with that coax and calibrate that out of the circuit. Now I can be in the shack and I can test my antenna because it's taken into account because you did the calibration. Then you tell the display, what do you want to do? Are you going to measure VSWR, loss? You want a Smith chart, blah, 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 blah. Then the frequency markers are a good thing. I'm going to go into them a little bit more. But those, again, show you reference points. And on this, you're able to move them and able to read the numbers that are associated with it. So it's not just the graph. You're going to see the numbers that you can read on it. Finally, you hook the Nano VNA to your device under test and get your data. Now it's got 101 display points. So left edge and then 100 things going across to the right edge. Now, if you decide you want to scan from one meg to one gig, okay, you're going to have pretty big frequency steps because it's only going to make 100 steps across that range. Now, if you want to get better resolution, you, you move it down to a smaller frequency range. So if you scan from 144 to 148, that two meter band is going to be divided into 100 points and you're going to get a lot of detail. But if you're going from one meg to 100 uh, to one gig, it's <laughs> you're not going to get very good resolution and you maybe miss things. There could be things in there that you miss. So one of the things though is this calibration sounds really scary. It has five calibration memories. So if you've determined uh, I want, I'm going to want to measure 20 meters a lot, you can do the calibrations on, let's say, a coax, piece of coax for the 20 meter band. And you can store that in a memory. Then if you're smarter than me and you take notes on it and you say, oh, memory zero is the 20 meter band with coax number five, then it will remember that. You don't have to perform that calibration anymore. It's in there. You can recall the calibration. So this is, a, this is an advantage. It's got five memories. I always forget. I don't use it that much. So I end up calibrating it each time. It's really not that hard once you've done it. So how do you select a frequency? The main menu has a, a, a selection called stimulus. Then you tell it, I want to start. You type in your numbers. And you say either times 1 or K or M or G. Obviously, times 1 is obvious. K is thousands, M, millions, G, gig. 
and you select stop, do the same thing, put in a frequency and, and it's done. It, and then you can go back to your uh, first menu. Now, this is the structure map. I said I'd bring that up a couple times. So you can see in the upper left, main, the, the main menu, stimulus. And if you follow that arrow, it'll get you down to the other section where I say start and stop and numeric keypad. So this is with a part of its menu structure that you're using. So you set a frequency. When you're setting a frequency, this is basically what it's going to look like. A bad example in that it's the brightness, but it shows you that's a number pad. Now, if we were doing the frequency to the right of the three would be the K, to the right of the six would be the M, and to the right of the nine would be the G. So if I wanted to start at uh, the bottom of 20 meters, I could type one, four, and then hit the M, and it'll say, okay, you wanna start at 14 meg. Real simple. So calibration is a process where you select Cal, you probably reset it to get rid of what it's working with currently so it's not polluted. If you've got the memory, you can just pull it back at that point. Otherwise, you'd select the menu thing for calibrate, and it's going to give you a list of things. And so you leave your coax, your cables open, and then you hit the open. And it measures the phase of the signal that it's getting back from that open piece of coax. And it says, okay, when there's an open out there, that's what it looks like. It, the phase might be anything at this point, but it's going through the frequencies, and it says this is what it looks like when there's an open on it. Then you put a short on the end of that piece of coax, and you press the short button, and it now knows what a short out there is. This is how you calibrate the device to get rid of your cables so that they're not part of what you're measuring anymore. Put the 50-ohm load on, boom, you got it. If you're going to measure TVI filter or something like that, where you're going through the device, then you need to do these other two steps for isolation and through. Basically, it's trying to say, okay, when it's open between the two, what's that second port look like? That's the isolation. And then if you connect your wires together, because you've got a wire now on that other port, connect them together, it calibrates it here. I'm not going into it a whole lot. But... That's what it's like. It sounds like a lot, but actually it's just, it's just three things and you got to figure out your plumbing. I think they spend more time figuring my plumbing than anything else. So this is what you're doing. Again, Cal on the main menu, Cal or the reset, then the calibrate, then the open short load isolation through and done. That's the rightmost near the bottom. And when you're done, then you can say, hey, save it in zero, one, two, three, or four. Not really that hard and it's there for you later. So then to set up the display, main menu, display, select trace. Now here's my suggestion to you, K-I-S-S. -S. Turn off traces, it's got four traces that it can do and it can do them all simultaneously for you. It gets really complicated. Turn off traces one, two, and three probably. You're probably gonna wanna use, at least starting out, VSWR, Trace zero is already set up to do VSWR for you. So just turn off traces one, one two, and three. Okay, and it, it defaults to yellow color. If you wanna change the colors, you can. It's got, got those menus. And then with format, you'd select SWR. So there it is again. Display, trace, one SWR, uh, the format. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay, did I say it can be a mess? This is kind of how it comes default. I think they want to demonstrate what it can do. Don't turn everything on. This has actually got four traces in there. Near the top, you can see something yellow. It says CH0, that's channel zero. It's measuring SWR. Each graduation on the screen is one. Apparently this thing is open circuit right now because my SWR is something like 2 billion. Well, that's not, <laughs> not very helpful. And you can't see the yellow. You can't see that yellow marker in there. That's because it's somewhere way up in the North Pole. Then uh, trace number two is this, I'm going to call it blue. I guess it's, uh, I don't know, cyan or something. 
but it says it's doing a logarithmic magnitude reading, 10 dB per division. Remember, decibels are logarithmic. A factor of 10 dB is a factor of 10. So it's always logarithmic. And it's saying it's somewhere around minus 69 dB. Then the green, that's a Smith chart now. I'm not going to go into it very much, but Smith charts have this circle kind of relationship. There's a lot of information in them. You should learn about them if you want to, but I won't go into it a lot. And then finally, you've got the, the pink or magenta, whatever. That's also back at channel one. That's the second port. It's measuring phase. And I can't read, it's something 90 per graduation. And it's at a, a, a minus 94 degree relationship. Underneath that in white, I know that it's giving me data at my marker number four, which is set at 402 megahertz. And then underneath that, it's telling me the distance from number four, from marker number four to marker number three is 68 megahertz. I don't know why we want that right now, but we could. At the bottom, it says that I'm sweeping from 130 megahertz, start 130 megahertz, and I'm stopping at 470 megahertz. So all that data on that one little screen. Now that little cyan blue thing, hang on a second. Get rid of something that popped up on my screen. Anyway, um, that little cyan at the bottom, you see a triangle that says one, and then it has a bump and it comes over and it says three, and then four and two. Those are all frequency markers, okay? Now we know from up above that number four is set at 402 megahertz. So that's where that number four is. If you go up to the pink magenta line, you'll notice that it's got a triangle that says one. It's at the same place. It's got one that says three. It's the same place as the three down below. Four is the same as, and two is the same. It has four traces. They can be doing totally different things, but your frequency markers will show up on each of the traces and they're at the same place. What is it, what's he saying? He said it's at the same place. Look at the circle. It's got one, two, three, and four, but they're in different places. Well, the markers are at the same frequency. The way the Smith chart reads out for uh, its data output, it's not a linear across the screen kind of thing. It has the circular, but those markers at the same place. So where I see the one in the lower right in green, that's at whatever frequency the magenta and the uh, cyan markers are on frequency one. Don't turn everything on at once. <laughs> you can see it's kind of confusing. So about markers, you know, to get to it, you select marker from the thing and then you can highlight whichever one is there. And if this was a small class, you know, it'd be easy to, to have the nano out and we could push it and you could see it, that would be great but it doesn't work that easily on Zoom. I couldn't figure out a good way to do it. So this was the best I could come up with, is you've got that, that menu, and it goes into this other part of the thing. It's pretty simple. You can see there aren't a whole lot of other things in there. Oh, let me go back one. By the way, it says start, stop, center, span. There's an error in this menu structure map. There are actually different things there. And one of them goes into the start, stop, center, span thing. Um, I have a corrected one, but I don't have it in the, in the thing. But if you go and you compare everything, you'll find out that that's an error. So did that scare you? Did it seem complicated? Is it always complicated like that? No. That's basically a full-scale first-time setup. You have kind of follow the directions, and you got it done. And then if you just want to do SWR again, you've already got your traces set up. If you're using the same frequency range, you've got it calibrated. It gets a lot simple, a lot simpler. Now I did that, all that extra detail that may not have been great for you because I wanted to have kind of a cookbook out here. If you buy one, you can get back to this presentation and you can see these basic steps and that will help you get through the process. Okay, once again, K-I-S-S. -S. 
Okay, don't try to do everything at once. Do try to learn the capabilities one at a time. Yeah, one at tea time. Yeah, if you're British, I guess it's at tea time. Anyhow, um, always do the calibration. Now, here's a big thing. This is not an expensive device. I think they're down in the $50 range now. You can spend $10,000, $20,000 on a VNA. Those things have hardware to help separate the signals. This thing doesn't have that expensive hardware. It's lightweight because of it, but it's also inexpensive. The secret is that it's using SDR technology to separate those signals and measure those phases. So it doesn't have to have the expensive hardware, but the calibration is essential because it doesn't have the hardware. You're not spending the bucks. You have to spend a little time. And uh, emphasizing again, the cables that you connect to this are part of the circuit. If you don't, you, you, can, you don't have to, you can just calibrate the, the, the machine itself. Then when you hook the cable up, it's part of the circuit and it will change your readings. Maybe that's fine for what you're doing. Keep it in mind. The cables are part of your circuit. Keith told me this right away when he said, hey, you bought one. You, you know, uh, KME told me this. Have a pencil. Get a pencil. Your finger is too fat. He's right. My finger is too fat. You have a pencil. You have an eraser on the back end of it. That's your stylus. It makes it so much easier to operate this device. And just a little old wooden pencil. Now, this might be the most important thing. I find myself out trying to adjust my vertical antenna. So I'm standing on the top of a 12-foot tall ladder. I'm doing that in the daylight, of course. And I hook up the Nano VNA. And I got this, this trace. And I can't see it. It's too bright out. This thing, that's why I was on the brightness screen. <laughs> Can I make it brighter? Nope, can't make it brighter. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you disconnect it and you go down into the, the room. Well, as soon as you disconnect it, it's still sweeping. It's still taking readings. As soon as I disconnect it, all the data I had went away. Shh. Okay, so I said there's got to be a way to do this. And sure enough, in the menus, there's a thing called pause sweep. So if you pause the sweep, it holds the data. Now I can disconnect it. I can go down in the shade. If I don't, then I have to go up and, and set up the antenna. I go up at dusk. I make a measurement. I figure out, okay, I need to make this change to the antenna. I'm not going to do that after dusk. I'm not going to take it down and try to do it. So what do I do? I'd have to wait till the next day, pull it down, make a change, put the damn thing back up. Then I'd make another measurement. Still can't see it because it's daylight. So wait to dusk again. One cycle per day. Uh-uh. Pause sweep. This, this, is, this is just about as important as knowing to use a pencil. These are simple, but man, it's practical. Okay, it can also be connected to a computer, to a laptop, and you get apparently more capabilities. You can get that data into the computer. The computer can massage the data. I haven't used a PC. I have uh, Greg Lane's K7SDW. I have his permission to tell you he has used a computer with it, and he can tell you a little bit about that. So the charging cable that you get, that's also a data cable. So it's, it's there, that's all you have to do. Now, as I mentioned, it can be act, configured as a time domain reflectometer. That's really a cool tool. And, and here's another idea. It could be used as a field strength meter, okay? How would you do that? Well, I'm gonna give you a couple of, of uh, things. This is, again, a borrowed slide. But if you look at the yellow trace, you can see it runs across the axis until it gets just past marker number one. Then it gets a bump, and it goes at that level for a distance, and it goes crazy. Well, the instructions or the, the data that they told us is this was four feet of 50-ohm coax that had basically a double female connector to some 93-ohm coax. What happens? We get a bump at four feet. It, it's you've now converted that signal to be like a radar. It went down, it found the discontinuity between the 50 and the 93 ohm coax, and I see a bump there, okay? So if I have a piece of coax and, uh, you know, I think maybe that HF amplifier blew it out, you know, it's, it's RG58, and I really shouldn't have put that thousand watts into RG58, especially with that SWR. 
have I killed my coax? Well, you, if you have a true short, your own meter can tell you, but it might just have a bad spot. It could have a sag. You know, 9913, if it gets really hot, can have a sag. You can see that kind of thing on this sort of thing. So a time domain reflectometer, I haven't set it up that way, but man, that's a cool tool. Again, not very expensive. Okay, so this is what the, the, somebody did is they, I guess it's a home brew, probably a UHF antenna, and they went outside the near field. They went far enough away so that they're in what's called the far field. And the insert uh, towards the upper right shows that they've got a little different version of a nano VNA. But what they did is they took the signal source port and they ran it into a piece of coax. And they ran that coax down to the antenna. Then at the receiving port, the, the channel one port, they put a little vertical antenna. Then they were able to sweep the antenna circular a couple of times. As they're doing that, the computer is collecting the data. I don't know how they instrumented the angles versus the uh, signal. But in the image part, lower left, you can see a trace that was created from this process. I would never have thought to use this as a field strength meter for trying to map an antenna. Great ideas. If you understand how the tool works, it's doing a swept frequency or a CW frequency out of one port. It can receive on that port or the other port. This basic stuff can get you into a lot of ideas. So what else? Well, I got, I'm cheap. I went to a Silent Keys state, estate and I bought some stuff and it was cheap. But of course, no one there tell you if it's good or bad. Why was it just laying around? So I got a dual band antenna and I got a diplexer. And I thought, well, let's find out. Can I find out if they're good or bad using the nano VNA? So this X200 on the left, we see the VSWR charts that it's supposed to have. And you can see it should be oh, better than 1.7 from 144 through 148. And on 70 centimeters, it's really broad. It's like below 1.3 from 435 to 450. So yeah, I like that. Those are good specs. So I hooked it up and I did this many months ago and, and, and all of a sudden I found, hmm, on two meters, I got two to one SWR points and they're not outside the band. One of them's at 145.5 inside the band. And one of them's up at 149.5. So yeah, I get a good match at 147. So yeah, it looks like uh, two meters works, but it's, uh, it's tuned high. For some reason, it's high. Don't know why. So I went to 70 centimeters and holy wow. <laughs> I scanned from like 418 to 450. I found a dip at 421. And then I found another dip at 446. And it got as bad as 3.3 as to 1 at the 432 range. Uh, that's, those numbers don't look anything like that chart, do they? Okay, there's something going on with this antenna. Yeah, I can play with it. I can throw it away. It was cheap. So I thought I'd, I'd go back for this presentation and I'd do it again. So here I'm sweeping from 130 to 470 meg. And you can see a dip at 147. And towards the right, you can see the double dip at 442 and 446. Huh, my other measurements didn't, didn't show that up. But I see the 422. But look at there. 225. Wait a minute. This is not a tri-band antenna. This is a dual band antenna. What the heck is that doing there? I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think that 225 dip is there because something is foobar inside it. Hmm. Maybe it's usable. Maybe I should use this for a 220 antenna because I don't have a, a 220 antenna. So set up, like I said, you want more data, narrow your frequency range. So you can see this sweep it's from 218 to 227. So the, the, the match is pretty bad at 218, and it's getting bad up at 227. But point number three, you can see that little triangle marker on the bottom. Point number three is at 224.03. Top of the screen, it says 3 colon 224.03. So that's where marker number three is. And the data for that is in the yellow on the left. 
it's a 1.25 to 1 match. Hey, that's not too bad. Now, SWR can be deceiving because if an antenna is purely resistive, it takes all the energy. But if it has these reactances, inductive or capacitive reactances, it can make it look like it's a better SWR, but it's not really taking all the energy. So I decided I'd use the Smith chart. So here's a little practical example. All I did was I told the device, instead of showing me the log magnitude for VSWR, just plot it as a Smith chart. And there's that number three. Now, in, in the center of that circle, there's the horizontal line, and there's a small circle that intersects right at the center. That's the sweet spot. That's where you want your antenna to be. That is a 50 ohm, purely resistive point. So on the Smith chart, you want it right smack dab in the center. That three is not too far away. So yeah, it not only looks like a pretty good match, but it actually is. It's a little to the right of where I want it to be. That means its impedance is a little bit, or it's, I should say its resistive component is a little bit high. And it's a little bit above the horizontal axis. So that means it's a little bit inductive. And yea, verily, if we go to the top of the screen in the yellow, it says Smith chart, 1.0 for full scale. It says it measures as 58.8 ohms resistive with 6.3 nanohenries of inductance. So that's a cross check, not too bad. Now, if I wanted to, I could try to find some sort of a very small capacitor and series it, and I could null out that Henry, uh, that inductive reactance with a small capacitive reactance. Now, if I'm doing a single frequency, that's good. If I'm doing more, you know, I don't know. I did not include it in this uh, presentation, but I was going to try to do something with a Ringo. I don't know how many of you might remember the Ringo antenna. It's a half wave uh, vertical resonant uh, radiator. And of course, a half wave should have a high impedance at its end. The Ringo then has this spiral piece of metal that goes down to the chassis, to ground. So we've got high impedance at one end of this ring, and we've got ground at the other end. And it has a little arm that comes out from, uh, from it that, that will touch at a different point on that. A Smith chart like this and a nano would be great because I could adjust the length until it was purely resistive, okay? I get that marker three, for example, right on that horizontal line. Now, it might be a, a bad match because it might have the wrong, wrong resistive component, but if it's at resonance, it will be resistive, and then I would be able to move that little arm on that ring until I got the, the, re the resistive component I want. So by doing the two things and using a Smith chart, that would make it real simple. Something to think about. So this was the other thing was the diplexer. And I'm, I'm getting done, people, so try to bear with me. I may be running too long. Um, so it, they call it a duplexer. And by the way, it's not a duplexer. Duplexer has a definition. It's for simultaneous receiving and transmitting at like on a repeater. A diplexer is for splitting the frequency. So they've named it wrongly. But you can see this thing is supposed to have one port on the left that goes between 1.6 and 150 megahertz, very broad. And then it has the other port that's basically for 70 centimeters from 400 to 460 meg. So I hooked it up. I did it really fast. I probably hooked it up kind of wrong in that I'm stimulating it at the antenna end. I probably should have stimulated it from the radio end. I'm going to assume that it's bidirectional. So this is OK. And if nothing else, it tells me how it's responding from the antenna end. I also hooked up my channel 1 to the opposite end of that cable that's good for HF. Why did I do that? This is a question to the audience. I want you to think for just a second. Why would I do that? Why is that important? Because it is important. I'm only measuring SWR. So that's only channel zero out and coming back. Why do I care about the other end? Because if signal goes through the, the diplexer and goes to the end of that other cable, and that other cable is open, 
it's going to reflect. And it's going to come back through the diplexer and come back to my instrument. I'm going to get an altered result. By hooking up to the other port, I gave it a nice 50 ohm termination so that the signal goes out, goes through, comes back. I don't care that it comes back, but I'm using it as a termination. It gives me a better result. What did it look like? Well, there you go. At 151 megahertz, we can see that the SWR is up to 1.14. And from that 151 meg down to 2 megahertz, it's pretty flat. So yeah, hey, that port is working pretty darn good. I'd say that's good. And we can see that as we go up in frequency, it, it goes way off. It's definitely kicking it out. So go to the other port. So my marker here, marker number one, is at 376 meg. It's a 1.41 match. Well, I'm not into 70 centimeters yet. I'm, I'm well away, so not a problem. And I can see it gets better as it gets towards 70 centimeters. So yeah. Hey, I'd say this thing's working pretty good too. Oh, well, wait a minute. If I'm going to have a transmitter, maybe I have an HF transmitter on one port and my 70 centimeter radio on the other port. Is it going to protect that 70 centimeter radio adequately from the 100 watts that I might be going out of my, my amplifier? So I reconfigured it. I said, okay, let's hook across the two so I can see how well it separates it. Well, now I had an open antenna port, so I brought out a, a, a termaline and terminated that so that it's a reasonable simulation of the real world. And so what did I find? I found that at a frequency I won't be using, something like 231 meg, okay, I've still got 23 dB of isolation between those two ports. That's not too bad, but it really isn't quite relevant. So then I replumbed it and I said, okay, how does it look when I... Uh, looking at the two meter side, if my uh, if, what's my UHF doing? What's my two meter side doing? Hey, I got 58 dB of isolation, really good. And going the opposite way, I got 67 dB of isolation. I like it. I think this thing works. So I'm willing to use this and, and trust my radio. I didn't have to just hook it up and find out whether the front end of my other radio smoked. That's it, guys. So that's an introduction to the nano VNA, some things you can do with it, a little bit about how its menus work. So I don't know. You decide whether you want one or not, but uh, I really like it. And so, Andy, I'm going to pass it back to you. And if there are questions, I can do that. Or um, Greg might like to share a little bit about what happens when you use a computer. I know I've, I've run us kind of long. Oh, it was an excellent presentation. So uh, why, don't, why don't we first, uh, if there are any questions for Warren, why don't we do that and then we'll go to Greg. Uh, Norm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, this model that you show is H4. Are there different models or is that the one yeah. we should be getting or what? Excellent yeah. point. And yes, the early ones were called fairies and there are other, other models, different configurations. There may be uh, something newer than the H4, but uh, as I say, the, uh, the presentation that I borrowed from, you may have noticed on there that it was from uh, January of 2020, I believe. And he said it went to one gigahertz. So I, he may have had like an H3. I've got the H4, it goes to 1.5 gigahertz. So there definitely are different models. The H4 is, is one is recommended, but there may be something newer. Other questions? Okay. Uh, question? Ed, Ed had his hand up for a second. Uh, did you still have a question, Ed? No. Okay. Uh, anyone else have a question? Phil? Hey, yeah. Hey, um, I have this one. I haven't done much with it, Warren. There's a little tag that sticks out of there, a little green tag. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's supposed to be. That's the fuse. Yeah. You, you... <laughs> That's the fuse? <laughs> It's a terrorist device. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen anything with the green tag. I'm take it out. I can't pull it out. It's like no, no, no. There. You undo the uh, Phillips screwdrivers. The plate comes off. Then you peel it off. All it is is protecting the glass. You can leave it on there, Bill. It's a touch screen, so that way you don't get it all dirty. 
but if people really just want to have the glass so it's uh, you know touches you you take the four yeah. screws off where the tab is it, the screws come out they're just phillips and then when you remove that particular frame you pull off you pull the green tab it pulls off the the film I just had mine a little while ago anyway <laughs> And, and then oh. you just screw it back on and you're home free. Okay, Greg, thanks. It does does the tab go between the two halves? No, no, no. It's just a it's just a piece of plastic to protect the glass. The tab is oh, I understand, but the, I'm asking Bill, it, it, is that tab can, between yeah. between the two halves? It's between yeah. the glass and the frame. You can't you can't pull it out unless you take the frame off. You can't okay. remove the plastic. I was film. thinking it might be to protect the battery. If you turn it on, does it come no, on? No, no, it has nothing to do with the battery. Yeah, that's what I thought originally. It has nothing to do with the battery at no. all. Okay. Just, I, I, think, uh, I think Phil Bartlett had a question. I had uh, a comment, yes. Uh, just, just, just a nanosecond here while I uh, get rid of this. Um, also, make sure you're understanding the name of the game here. Um, Oop, I gotta close my inside window. But um, you see this? This is a nano VNA H, which has the uh, uh, basically one and a half gig, but it's a two inch screen. Oh, mine is a four point something, I believe. Here is the nano vna h4 which is yeah. a four inch screen right okay if you're considering buying one make sure you know what you're getting make sure to get the larger one it is much much easier to use and this has also uh 1.5 gigs so the specs are the same it's just got a larger screen and it uh has the same functionality I like my larger screen and uh, on the computer and, and cheaper books on the smaller one. Hi, hi. Yeah. <laughs> you could plug both of these into a computer and use uh, other tools with the data. And also they have an interface uh, that helps you see the same information that these have on your uh, computer screen and you can save data and then you can manipulate it. So it's real handy. Hey, um... Great. Uh, Greg, did you want to talk about the computer application? Yeah, I would like to do that. I've got to get on uh, this full screen here so I can uh, get on the share. So you got to share a screen for me? I, I think you can go ahead and do it. Oh, okay. Good enough. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you can see all this, uh, yeah. This was our, you may not be doing another, see if this is the live one. No, this is the, this is the dead one. <laughs> well, no, no matter. Uh, this program, Nano Saver version, does everything you want to do without having to deal with the touch screen of the Nano little one or the Nano H4. So the Nano VNAH or H4 is just a, a larger one. Um, see if I get over here on, on my uh, uh, other one here. here on, the, on the other video, if you can see but the other panel where my, I had a Greg K7 SCW, th this is what the other, can you see that one on the other panel somewhere it, down the road? It hasn't changed, Greg. You're still on the, no, the Not on this shared screen, on one of the other tabs. I guess when you do a share screen it, it, that you can't use multiple tabs. Right. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Neither here or then. <laughs> Unless you pass it to pass on your screen and then you can I, I was trying to use my phone in order to zoom. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that later. But you can see right here in terms of where the band plan is, you can, you, all the bands for the hams are in here that you can pull in for calibration. So when you want to go to calibration, you go over here and if you have calibrated data that you loaded, which I have, I do a long test cable, I pull that in, I open it up, and I apply it, and I'm all set to go in terms of using my test cable for things I want to do. Uh, then I have to do um, set as a current reference, I believe, and maybe do a, a sweep on it. 
and that's that, that's this is my error one it's not really the one i really should be showing get back to the uh get to the other guy here too many windows open okay is that the one i had before let's see. Well, while you're doing that i will point out that some things that you can see these are all s11 okay yes. so they're they're all using that port zero originating the signal and reading it the top left thing he has is circle that's a smith chart underneath it shows the vswr and then to the top right the return loss notice that there's a lot of loss it's very sharp uh, return loss there and then at the bottom is the z which is the impedance that's complex resistance and reactance generals will understand that but the technicians may not but so you can see that one set of, set of data can be interpreted and displayed in a number of different ways. So that, that gives you one idea. You, it collects this table of data, and then you can massage it. Now, on the, on the device itself, I could probably configure it to show all of that at one time. It would all be over on top of itself, and it would be difficult. Here, this looks like it's a lot more convenient. Back I'm to you, Greg. doing a continuous sweep, and what I did is I uh, put on the Terminator, remove the Terminator. What I like about this program is you can you can set your your things right wherever you want to in terms of doing your sweeps and set, and then you can save the particular data. You can show the data or hide the data. <clears throat> what I did here was using this particular device because I'm uh, lazy. I did it all with an MFJ, but uh, doing this it only took a day with the MFJ was taking me couple, more than a couple of days. So in uh, one of our filter kits, I have terminated the uh, end of the uh, quadplexer. So I'm in through the 70 megahertz filter into the quadplexer, but I've already did a pre-calibrated cable. So, you know, if I looked over here in time domain, you can see here, it's not going to be real. All, all this footage is all the delay going through the, all the filters and whatnot. But uh, what's really nice about it is that uh, if you really want to know how things are happening in your uh, Butterfield filters, it, we're showing that the impedes here is really close to 50 ohms. We're showing here in terms of where the band is able to operate in the 7 megahertz portion of the band for 40 meters and so how it's going to stop everybody else. Okay, and of course, and here's the Vizwar. So you, if you want to go with a different sweep in terms of a, uh, I got to stop it first because I've got it on continuous. So if I want to say, well, what yeah, is what you're, whatever you're doing, Greg, is not coming through to us. We're still just looking at that first chart. First chart. I, I think you, I think you've made the point though. So okay. uh, yeah, yeah, the point is get your uh, the cable that comes with it, plug it into your your VNA, and you'll you'll have a heck of a lot more fun. Then uh, you can also print a, a case for it to protect it. I printed I printed the cover with the, this one with my call sign. Well, the camera's not picking up too well. <laughs> That's what I was going to use the other. Well, if you yeah, unshare, yeah. if you unshare the screen, we can uh, see your. Yeah, let's let's do that. Let me get where it says uh, new no, that new share unshare. Got to get the stop share. There we go. Oh. Anyway, yeah. So, okay. All right. Oh, yeah. So there's the, yeah. Okay. This is it's, part of the cover. The other part of the cover is over. I guess you could probably look at the other, uh, other view of Greg, Greg Lane on the other panel. I think <laughs> I'm on another panel. Let me get to it. Okay. Uh, I don't see, uh, are there any other questions? Just a quick comment. Yes. Um, be careful where you buy them. <laughs> Uh, there are uh, ones that look just like other ones, and they're no good. So uh, I believe uh, Rob uh, mentioned, uh, not Rob, uh, Warren mentioned RNL Electronics. Absolutely, they're they're great. I got mine from uh, what they call Deep Elec, and it's a little bit more money. Uh, this one will do uh, almost two gigs, and look, it has it's labeled Port One and Two. Not zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like you say, you get you pay what you you get what you pay for. Yeah, and it's in a full metal case. It uh, did away with that little uh, half wheel because a lot of people had problems with that half wheel. Um, but Ed's mine goes, is Ed's goes to eleven. Yeah. 
mine was closer to a, mine mine was closer to a, like 120 dollars um but it, it it's fabulous it just works great and it hooks up to the computer just like uh the other one and uh it's so much better than just a standard little uh, SWR meter. Yeah. You really want to know what's going on. That's what you need. Well, and, and I will comment again that MFJ226, I was perfectly happy paying 300 bucks for it. Now, it has one advantage is that I can read it in full daylight. Okay. But it only would go through the 220 band. It won't, won't do anything at 70 centimeters or above. So... And a lot of us, I think, want to be able to get to 70 centimeters. So just, you know, there's always an advantage and disadvantage. But as Ed's saying, pay attention to the specs. <laughs> Phil pointed out that I didn't even realize they had the, the micro mini nano. I mean, nano is small enough. I don't know how you can get a nano nano uh, unless you're more, I guess. But anyhow, so that's all I can think of. Back, yeah, we uh, really back good present, really good presentation, and I hope it's a tickler for the people who have their technician license to go for their general and their extra, because this will teach them a, a whole bunch about resonance and circuitry and mathematics, and, and, and if using this as a tool could probably help them because with the information that's displayed on the screen, you could put it in your calculator and say, oh yeah, I did my LC and I did that division, and by God, I got the same answer the computer did. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, let's give a big hand to Warren. I, that was an excellent presentation. Very meaty. Lots of lots of things to uh, to think about. Um, next month will be uh, a great topic for the uh, the new uh, generals that will be finishing uh, Bill's class. Uh, we're having uh, Stu Sheldon come back and talk about uh, 